Hello, scaredy cats. It's me, Scaredy Matt. Today I want to talk about a book. I don't own it because I read it on an e-reader, so just pretend I'm holding it up to you now. Wow! Cool cover! It's called NOS4A2, which I will now refer to as Nosferatu moving forward for clarity's sake. Probably the biggest hurdle I have in recommending people this book is the title. It's a very confusing title. I tell people about a book I liked and then they ask, oh, what's it called? And then I have to say, well, actually, that's kind of complicated. And then they say, well, how can the title of a book be complicated? And uh, here we go. It makes sense in the story. It's a license plate on a car that's very important in the world of the book. Probably a bad choice of title, I'll admit. But look past the title, friends. Come with me on a journey to the world of imagination where words become little movies in your head. That's the magic of reading. Nosferatu is a 2013 novel by Joe King, better known by his nom de plume, Joe Hill. Joe's the son of Stephen and Tabitha King, who you might remember as the drunk audience members in the film Knight Riders. Knight Riders. Throw down the gauntlet, take up the challenge. A new age begins. Romance and adventure live. I don't have a ball for wearing anything like that. Don't I wish? <laughs> Give me a beer. Night Riders. They ride for the crown. They fight for honor. Also, Stephen King wrote some books or something. I don't know. I, I skimmed his Wikipedia article. Joe went by the name Hill so as to not give the appearance of riding his father's coattails. And that's sort of admirable, but like, come on, dude. Do you really think being the son of the world's most famous novelist didn't have anything to do with you getting an easier time getting published? Like, let's not pretend that there's no nepotism here. And I point this out because Hill's prose is very much in the style of King's. You spend large portions of time exploring the inner thoughts of the characters, their life stories, their insecurities. Everybody lives in a small town that America's left behind, though in this case it's Rhode Island, not Maine. This might sound like criticism, but I think he's actually taken a lot of his father's strengths into his writing, and I think he can withstand the scrutiny of the inevitable comparison. He's a legitimately good writer in his own respect, whose biggest influence is clearly his father. But he's not just a poor man's imitation of his father. I often felt while reading that this book was what I always want a Stephen King book to be. No shade to Stephen King, as though he really cares what some 2-bit YouTuber has to say. But he's a great content creator and a great idea originator. Hey, it's me, future editing Matthew. I just wanted to let you know that I meant to say character creator, but the internet has poisoned my brain. So I ended up saying content creator. Oopsie doodle. Who can't write a book to save his life. Hey, editing Matthew here again. I didn't mean to say book there. I meant to say ending. Obviously Stephen King can write a book. He's written like hundreds of fucking, the one thing he's really good at is writing books. It's endings that he struggles with. I'm. Yeah, I ended up sounding a lot meaner than I meant to. Uh-oh, there's a spooky being from another dimension that feeds on fear, and you're about to see its true form divorced from the delusions it implants in your head, and it's going to be the scariest thing you've ever seen, and it is a spider. Don't worry, though, everybody had sex, and that killed the monster for some reason. If you don't know what book I'm referring to, good luck guessing. Anyway, you'd be forgiven for assuming that this book is about a vampire, and it kind of is, but only allegorically. There did nobody drink in blood, but the primary antagonist, Charlie Manx, does kind of extend his life by taking life force from others. The way that he does that and the reasons that he does that are both very creative and difficult to talk about out of context, and I really wouldn't want to spoil it for you anyway. All of the characters in this book are well-developed and interesting, but Manx is the real draw here. You spend the whole book wondering about him, how he does the things he does, and why. And it's drip-fed to you without ever just dumping a bunch of exposition in your lap. He always feels unpredictable and mysterious, but simultaneously, by the end of the book, you get a complete picture of who he is. He's this whimsical, larger-than-life showman. He's always acting like a folksy grandpa. Like, the closest thing I could compare him to is, like, a evil Willy Wonka? And, and, you're, and you're waiting for the mask to slip off, right? You're waiting for him to change and like to reveal that it was all an act. But even when he's doing horrible things, he's still just that guy. He violently kills people, kidnaps children, and at one point beats a dog to death? And all the while he's just kind of chipper and folksy. 
He's a fully realized character, and by the end of the book, you really understand how he sees himself and what he does. He's my favorite kind of villain, someone whose motivations are crystal clear and logical, but never sympathetic, not even for a second. He's a repulsive monster, but as the story unfolds, you learn exactly what kind of monster he is and how he got that way. A lot of writers can get as far as realizing that the villains don't think of themselves as villains. But Joe Hill goes an extra step and gives the character a coherent, albeit demented, worldview that informs the way that his moral compass breaks down and makes him the monster he is. In the world of the book, the main characters possess a type of pseudo-magic called an inscape. Essentially, they can make things from their subjective inner experience manifest in the real world. Each of them can only do it in very specific ways with a very specific drawback. For instance, one of the characters can get a one-word answer to any question she asks from a bag of Scrabble tiles, but the answer has to conform to the rules of Scrabble, so no proper nouns, no abbreviations or contractions. But since she's pulling words out of a bag, she's getting words, the cost to her is in words. So she starts to lose her own words in the form of a stutter that she's had since her birth that gets worse over time the more she uses her magic. I don't want to give away too much because most of the fun of the book comes from trying to understand how each character's inscape works and what the limitations of it are and what it costs them, especially Manx. Maybe it's just because I don't read enough fiction nowadays, but by the time I was finished with Nosferatu, as satisfying as the ending was, I couldn't help but feel a little sad that it was over, that all the characters inside were going to go off and live their little lives and I wouldn't get to hear what happened after that. But I don't want a sequel. It's this, the story's done. It, it's fine. Please don't make a sequel to this book. A word of warning, this book isn't going to be for everybody. There is some challenging subject matter. There's a great deal of sexual assault that felt more than a little gratuitous to me. Child abuse is also a major theme in the book, as well as the trauma that results. There's some serious cycle of abuse shit in this book, and if you're particularly sensitive to it, I'd suggest you maybe give this one a pass. And now for the scaredy elephant in the room, AMC adapted this book into a television show, but I gotta tell you, probably read the book instead. To be fair, I've only watched the first episode, so maybe it gets better, but woof. No thanks. I was excited to watch it, but the one thing that I couldn't figure out is like, how is Zachary Quinto gonna pull off playing Charlie Manx? And I gotta say, he's the one thing that the show seems to have gotten right. I didn't think Quinto had it in him. He tends to play very stoic characters like Mr. Spot from Star Trek. It's really cool to see him off leash with a little bit more of a bombastic role. The rest though, the rest not so much. Trust me, this is one of the times when the book is, is the way to go. You looking for a spooky book? This is a spook book with scares. Readers beware, you're in for spooks, TM. How do people talk about books? I don't know. Normally I can distract you with video clips and you'd look at those and it doesn't matter what I'm saying. I usually just get two minutes in and then I start reading out lorem ipsum and nobody's noticed yet. I don't know, here's an otter. Does that work? Just pay attention to the otter, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. I don't know, am I done here? Is this the end of the video? Why am I asking you? You can't end the video, only I can end the video. I say that this is the end. We've ended it. This